Hi, my name is Marissa Gigantelli, and I am thrilled to be here today on behalf of the U.S. Green Building Council to give a presentation on the future is green, um, diving into electrical engineering. I am an electrical engineer, and I graduated with my master's in architectural engineering from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in 2018. So I've been working at Morsi for about two years full time, um, but I interned here while I was in college. We do a whole host of market sectors in our office. We do everything from car dealerships to multifamily housing to entertainment facilities, but my major focus is on office buildings and um, senior living facilities and senior care. And I am currently studying for my LEED Green Associates exam. So next I'm gonna show a quick video that I recorded about two years ago, but I feel like is really re relevant to this conversation um, in this discussion. And it's just gonna talk about how I got to where I am today, what I was involved in in high school. Um, and then it's also gonna dive into what architectural engineering is um, and specifically what I do as an electrical engineer. Hi, my name is Marissa Gigantelli. I am a 23 year old located here in Omaha, Nebraska. And I'm gonna take a quick minute to just discuss who I am and how I got to where I am today in the engineering field. So as I mentioned, I'm 23. I graduated from Westside High School in 2013 and then pursued an engineering degree from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, but I was located here in Omaha on the Omaha campus. About my sophomore year in high school, I knew I was really interested in math and science and my physics professor reached out to me and said, if this is the kind of coursework you're really interested in, you should really look into pursuing engineering. And she really emphasized that there would be a lot of opportunities for me um, within this particular type of degree and career path. And so I looked into it. There were some really cool things out there, and I got really excited, and I'm like, this is awesome. But I didn't have a program like this that could help steer and guide and direct me into the correct career path based on my passions. And so my junior and senior year of high school, I kind of struggled um, with the fact that I was applying to a bunch of schools um, in their engineering programs, but I didn't really know what that meant for a career path and where that was going to lead me after I graduated. And so I reached out to some local industry um, individuals in the Omaha area, along with some professors at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And I expressed my interest in sustainability and some of the things that I had been working on in high school. And um, with that, I decided to pursue a degree in architectural engineering. Architectural engineering is a really unique degree. Not a lot of people know what it is and what it means or that it even exists. Um, but it's really near and dear to my heart. And it's really interesting because it focuses on the engineered systems within a building. So there are three kind of options. You can either focus on the structural systems of a building that keep it up, the mechanical systems of a building that heat and cool the building, and then the um, power systems or the electrical systems that allow the building to be powered. And then um, pick, along with that comes picking the light fixtures and the lighting of the space. So I decided to pursue the electrical emphasis and um, I have a job that I have started here in Omaha where I design um, the electrical systems for commercial buildings. So I really focus on um, how power is being distributed throughout the building, determining what the person's needs are within that space and how we can um, adequately design the power and lighting to best fit that task. So now that we kind of have an overall understanding of what architectural engineering is, what does the day-to-day -day life of an electrical engineer look like? Um, so on a typical day, we are working in large project teams to help design a building. So those project teams will include owners and architects and sometimes construction managers. And we work in those teams to help de develop and design um, and create these design documents or um, blueprints or drawings construction drawings are sometimes what they're called. Um, so we're working a lot of times in 3D models to create those drawings. So we're working in programs like Revit and AutoCAD, um, but we're also doing different types of modeling like daylight modeling or energy analysis or um, lighting calculations and lighting modeling. So we're spending a lot of time in the 2D and 3D plane. But at the end of the day, it's up to us to give our expertise and knowledge 
on the different electrical systems within a building, um, using our code knowledge and referencing that while also being able to portray and convey all of our information to the design team in a clear and concise manner. So how a project starts out is an architect kind of has a building or a plan for the space and they will come to us and say, okay, we have this space, let's say this is a student center and we know it's gonna have a cafeteria in it. It's gonna have student workstations so that they can collaborate together. We're gonna have meeting rooms not just for the students, but for alumni to come back and use to conduct their business. And they turn over this 3D model to us and that's when we kind of hit the ground running. So we get these 3D models, but then it looks we look at it in a 2D plane. So this is that student center and we can see there's some furniture in here. There's lots of equipment, lots of kitchen equipment. There's some offices in the bottom um, corner of the space. There's a stairwell, so it's multi-level. Um, and we start to look at this and analyze the space and provide our expertise on how we're gonna properly distribute power and lighting. And so looking at some of the 3D modeling that we can do, this is a lighting model that we've created for this space. So we can build up the walls, um, we can throw in all the materials, we can put in all the lights that we expect to use in the space and get a pretty accurate representation of how bright that space will look. So we can get calculations that we can reference standards for to see, are we getting the proper amount of light? We can look at the way that the light fixtures look in the space. Are the ceilings gonna work with the pendants we've selected? Um, do we have too much light? We can also create different renderings that we can give to the architect um, and the owner to kind of get them to sign off and buy into our designs. So the final output looks something like this. Um, this is the final lighting layout for this space. And um, we've put all of our code expertise and knowledge into these drawings. Um, we provide construction notes and um, kind of deliver the set of documents to the contractor for them to then take these drawings and build the building. So at the end of the day, we get something that looks like this, um, a really pretty student center that has dining space um, and attracts both students and alumni to the space to use it for their needs. Um, when you're creating a campus building, it's really important that it, it in, excites the alumni and the students because um, the alumni are donating their money and time to make these facilities possible. One really cool thing that we did within this space is we provided um, extensive lighting programming to some of our facilities um, so that occupants within the space can see some really cool things that we do um, with lights. So this is going to be a light show that is programmed to the tunnel walk for the University of Nebraska. key features and highlighting areas in the building. Um, so for instance, we have done a lot of office buildings where they want one facade of their exterior wall or one stairwell to be a kind of light show to draw people into the space and excite them about their building. So at the end of the day, we're working in large project teams um, to make these projects possible. Um, it all starts with a developer who has some land and vision for the space an owner who wants to build a building for their, either their employees or their students. Um, and then you have an architect that helps make that vision come to life, an engineer that makes the systems possible. And then you have a contractor that designs the building or that um, constructs the building and then code officials that make sure that all the codes are being met. So moving into some trends and insights that we're seeing in the building sector um, in the energy sector, um, the United States consumes about 20% of the overall global, global energy consumption, and of that 20%, 40% is attributed to buildings. 
So it's really important that we start to look at how we can do better um, and how we can consume energy better and more efficiently within the built environment. So buildings use a lot of water. They produce a lot of CO2 greenhouse gas emissions. They use a lot of, um, they produce a lot of waste and they consume a lot of electricity. So these are really important things to think about as we are designing spaces. So moving into what makes Morrissey Engineering so special and why I really enjoy working here, um, we are really focused on sustainability. And we put that at the forefront of a lot of our design work. And we also strive to be leaders in the sustainability community and really help push the envelope in um, our market sectors and in um, our local community. So to do so, we created, um, we made sure that our headquarters was a very sustainable building. And we actually have the first um, platinum LEED certified building in Nebraska. So we are really, um, honored to have that space and to continue to push um, our design throughout um, as we continue to grow and do more buildings. So we do have renewable energy on site. We actually have done two um, iterations of photovoltaics on our building and this helps offset our energy use. Um, we also have skylights behind those photovoltaic panels closer to the parking lot and again, this is another design feature that we did to allow for more daylight to penetrate into our office building where we may not have as many windows. So these are two aspects of lead driven design um, design strategies that we employed in our space. And again, these were an extra design effort. They weren't something that we just put on every building. They took extra design concern and consideration. So next I'm gonna show a quick little walkthrough I'm kind of going into our office building and I want to highlight some lead features that we have as we walk through the video and then um, I'm going to highlight some at the end as well. So walking into our office building here on the right, we are going to see a bunch of certifications on the wall for different projects that we have worked on um, that have become lead certified. Um, also, as we walk in, we're going to pan over and see a video wall. This is not a lead feature, but this is a really awesome way for us to highlight a bunch of our product projects and show them to clients as they come into the space. We have a living wall there on the left. And then as you can see, we have a lot of daylight penetrating into the space, which is really awesome. Um, but we do have also LED lighting that can help provide adequate um, workstation lighting and task lighting. And then as we move into our break room here, you can see we have great views out of our um, west facing facade. We have a pond, which allows for us to see lots of wildlife. Um, it makes work very just visually stimulating and interesting. Some things that we also have within our building that were not highlighted in that video are we do have bicycle storage and showers. We have um, low flow water fix or low flow fixtures and on site irrigation to help with our water usage. Um, we have an enhanced envelope. We have um, renewable energy on site, all of our materials were selected um, adequately so that they weren't producing an excess amount of um, particulates into the air. Um, we have ventilation monitoring and we also have UV germicidal lamps and all of our heat pumps to help clean the filters and make sure that the air that is going through our space is clean. And then we're also always doing um, different like feedback surveys throughout the year to make sure people are feeling comfortable in the space and that they have um, adequate thermal comfort. Again, all of these things are extra design efforts that we had to put into place and think about throughout the design process. They weren't just, not all of them were just easy to implement. We had to really think about these things. Some other things that we have in the building are we do have electrical vehicle charging, which is a great benefit in um, benefit to all of our employees. We can charge our electrical ve electric vehicles on site Monday through Friday during normal work hours for free. We also track our energy usage and this kind of allows us to see how much energy we're producing with our on-site renewable and how much we're offsetting from the grid. So the red line shows the amount of energy we are consuming from the grid peaking at about six starting around 6 a.m. and dropping off around 6 p.m. And then the green line shows the amount of energy that our renewable is um, contributing to. 
Every year we also do a waste audit and this allows us to see how much waste we are producing as a company and where it's being siloed into. So in 2018, we produced a lot more energy or a lot more waste than in 2017, which was important for us to analyze. And then we also noticed that we were producing a lot more organic waste. So that has allowed us internally to start thinking about, do we want to start composting? Because if we can do something better with that waste, um, it's something to just analyze. So why electrical engineering? Um, electricity is really a necessity to our overall life and the way that we live. And there's a big push to have more sustainable energy and sustainable systems. So I don't think that the electrical and engineering field is going away anytime soon. If anything, I think it's gonna flourish. And there's a big need for um, new bright minds to come into the industry and come up with different ways that we can produce energy sustainably. So a lot of times I get asked like, what's the difference between electrical engineering and environmental engineering, especially where within my degree with architectural engineering, where we focus so much on in, in sustainability and environmental systems. Um, so environmental engineering is defined as protecting people from the effects of adverse environmental effects, such as pollution, as well as improving the environmental quality. So the way I like to think of this is, is that Environmental engineers are really concerned about the environment. And um, so they might be looking at treating wastewater, um, the different pollutants that come off from in um, different like industrial facilities. Whereas electrical engineering is concerned with the study and design of electrical equipment and devices and systems. Um, so it's really focused a lot around electricity. Now architectural engineering allows us to dive into electrical engineering, but also have an environmental and sustainable aspect and outlet. So that's kind of how I define the difference between the two. Um, so you definitely can be an electrical engineer, but focus on environmental aspects. Think of it like you could work as an electrical engineer and design photovoltaic panels. So you're still having an impact on the environment, but you're an electrical engineer. So what does the path to electrical engineering look like? The typical path is a four year, typically a four to five year degree from a accredited program. So that's usually going to be at a four year university. When you graduate, you'll have your bachelor, bachelor's of engineering and you can then from there become a licensed engineer. For architectural engineering specifically, I would recommend looking at the University of Nebraska Lincoln where I went, um, but also Penn State. Kansas State and Cal Poly were all schools that we competed against in national competitions when I was in school. So they have great programs as well to look into. Now there is an alternative path. Um, if you're in school and you're thinking, well, like I don't know how my family's gonna afford a four-year university. I totally understand that. What are my options? Um, I think there's two options. One, STEM programs are really at the forefront right now of career path options. And so there's been a lot of money being funneled into STEM programs and specifically STEM scholarships. So I really recommend looking into scholarships at the schools you're interested in and seeing if you can find a scholarship that will help cover half to, full of, to a full ride of your um, college degree. But if you aren't really interested in that or you haven't been able to find any scholarship opportunities, um, I highly recommend looking at an alternative path, which would be a two-year associate degree. You could get this at a community college um, and would come at a, lo a lot less of a price point than going to a four-year university. Now, you could get a CAD tech degree from one of these universities. So you will learn through that two-year program how to design in the 2D and 3D space and create project drawings. But it's important to note that you cannot become an engineer, a licensed engineer with this degree, but you can work for an engineering firm and um, get experience that way. So the important um, di differentiating aspect between these two programs is that um, with a four-year degree, you can become a licensed engineer. With a two-year degree, you cannot, but you can still work for an engineering firm. So what does the path to electrical engineering look like? Um, you'll graduate with that accredited program from a four-year university. You will then take the fundamental of engineering exam, which is an exam you take after or during your last year of school, kind of just saying like, this is 
kind of validating the knowledge that you've learned throughout those four years and saying, yes, I retained all that information and I am allowed to now pursue um, to become an engineer. Then you're going to work four years under an engineer that is licensed. So they need to have their stamp and you're going to work four years under them or at an engineering firm that has licensed professionals. Then you will sit for your professional engineering exam, which is an exam you will take after four to five years in the industry that says, okay, now that I've worked for four to five years, I've learned all this knowledge and I know everything I need to know to be um, an electrical engineer that can take on responsibility in stamp drawings. And once you pass that, you will receive your stamp and you're considered a licensed engineer. So a question that I had a lot while I was in college and um, even when I started to get into my full-time career is how do you determine circuits? How do you determine the power that gets put throughout the building um, and the type of circuits that need to go there? How do I do the design work? Where do I begin? Um, and there's kind of two aspects to this. One is industry experience. So, Within the industry, as you're working, you start to pick up on trends and um, learn like, okay, this type of building is an office building. It usually consumes this much energy per square foot. Um, we're using this type of mechanical system. And I know that type of mechanical system uses this much energy per square foot. Um, or you would start to understand like, okay, this building has an electric kitchen. So I know it's gonna consume more energy than a kitchen that's gonna be running on gas. So these are the types of things that you learn over time while working in the industry that help you understand how big the electrical system needs to be for that space. And that kind of is the overarching design um, aspect of electrical engineering. You learn that throughout your experience. Um, but also on the very small scale, you also need to know um, what types of circuits you're pulling to different areas of a building. So now that you know the overall load of the building, how do you know what type of circuits need to go in a break room, in an office, in a kitchen? And that happens um, by looking at different um, equipment manuals and cut sheets and analyzing them. So this picture shows a dishwasher cut sheet. Um, and this shows like, okay, model C4 consumes four kilowatts of energy. It can be provided at 208 volts or 480 volts. It uses this many amps and this is the breaker it needs. And so we can use this information to then figure out, okay, these are the circuits we need, need in these specific areas, the type of wire we need to pull there. Um, we use our code knowledge and engineering expertise to help develop the drawings. So I also wanna to touch on some soft skills that make a great engineer. Um, most people know engineers are great at math, science, but especially at problem solving. But there's some soft skills that engineers can have that really set them apart from others in the industry. So number one is humility. Um, this isn't a career where you graduate from college and you know everything you need to know, you're done learning. Um, it's constantly learning, constantly picking up new information. Um, and so you need to be able to be humble and understand that you might not know the answer to everything, but you have to be driven to find those answers for your client. You also have to have a respect for others. We work in project teams with all different types of people that bring their expertise to the table. You have to have that respect for their knowledge um, and recognize the different qualities that they have um, and bring to the project. You have to also be able to effectively communicate. Um, we're working in project teams that can be up to 20 people plus. So it's really important to be able to document all of the things that you want to document and portray them in a clear and concise manner so that everyone on the project team can understand um, what you're trying to convey. So it's really important to effectively communicate and be able to communicate in the right um, methods to the right people. And finally, taking ownership. It's really easy to take ownership on a project when everything's going well, um, the owner's happy, uh, the project's winning design awards, but it's not so easy to take ownership when maybe something's gone wrong on the project. Um, it is really important to say like, that was us, that was our mistake. Um, this is why we did what we did. How should we move forward? And then as you resolve that issue, taking that knowledge that you learned from that project to the next project um, so that you can constantly be improving and doing better.
So with that, I would like to thank you all for your time. Um, I hope that you learned something new about architectural engineering and electrical engineering today, and that I have inspired you to um, look more into sustainable sustainability and energy in the building sector. Thank you.